my name is Lynn Smith and I'm the Senior Community Education Officer with the Residential Tenancies Authority. The role of the RTA is to administer the legislation and help everyone involved in a tenancy understand their rights and responsibilities. As today's topic is about what happens before a tenancy commences, which is usually outside the guidelines of the RTA, we have invited an expert from the real estate industry to share information with us today. Nick Brown is a qualified trainer with the Real Estate Institute of Queensland and a licensed real estate agent with over 18 years real estate experience, including nine years as a trainer with the REIQ. So welcome today, Nick. Thanks, Lynn. Pleasure to be here. Today we will be talking about key areas to know when you own or manage a rental property before the tenant moves in. First, when the lessor or the agent has a property available to rent, they need to comply with Section 185 of the Residential Tenancies and Rooming Accommodation Act 2008. At the start of the tenancy, the lessor must ensure the premises and inclusions are clean and the premises are fit for the tenant to live in and the premises and inclusions are in good repair and the lessor is not in breach of a law dealing with issues about the health or safety of a person using or entering the premises. Nick, what are the normal methods used to promote a rental property? Um, we live in a modern world where the majority of people will go to the internet in the first instance. Um, so uh, generic websites, um, listing portals, um, are usually the first port of call for tenant inquiries. So a lot of agencies will focus on that. Um, another thing that we do see with agents particularly uh, is that uh, they'll have a database of prospective tenants. So they might already have people that are, are ready to roll um, and ready to look at the property. So that's always their first port of call. Um, in the regional areas, we do see local newspaper advertising, um, and generally across Queensland, signage is still very prominent, um, but you do have to be mindful of any restrictions that that particular property may have on signage. In Queensland, a property being advertised for rent must advertise a fixed price. They cannot put a property up for rent auction or ask for offers. If the property is advertised at a fixed price, it does not stop a prospective tenant offering you more or less that amount. So let's talk about inspecting the property. How would a tenant inspect? Once you have the inquiries from your advertising, you can conduct a private inspection one-on-one -on -one, um, or do an open house. Um, it is rare these days to hand keys out. Um, you do need to be mindful of security uh, when it comes to the key side of things. And it's also uh, a good opportunity to have a chat with the prospective tenants about what they're after. Please note, if the property is currently rented, the lessor or their managing agent would need to give the current tenant notification of the entry to show prospective tenants through. You would use a Form 9 entry notice and give the correct time frame. Under Section 204, you would need to get the current tenant's written permission to conduct an open house to show multiple prospective tenants through. It's always best to communicate with the current occupant about what your proposed inspection plan is. So whether the property is vacant or you've given notice to an existing tenant to show prospective tenants through, what is the next step, Nick? Uh, once a tenant's viewed the property and is keen to move in, um, it's recommended to have the tenant complete an application, um, providing the lessor or the agent information about themselves. Um, some of that information will include not just their name and current details, um, but it'll also may um, be where they've rented in the past, um, where they work, sources of income, um, and even some personal character references. Um, often agencies um, and, and some uh, private landlords will ask for 100 points of ID. Okay? Um, that can vary, so you do need to be mindful as a tenant um, of that, um, but more importantly as an agent or as a property owner of letting the tenant know what you do actually require as part of that process. Um, references are very important as part of the application process. Uh, this could be current um, and or the work references as I mentioned a moment ago. Um, it's always wise to check out any references uh, provided. Um, using a checklist and a standard procedure is always important going down that track because you want to make sure that you ask the same questions of each applicant um, when you're getting those checks back. Um, I mentioned before copies of ID uh, briefly uh, and the 100 points of ID. So um, from an agent's point of view, um, we have to be able to prove to a property owner or a landlord um, that a prospective tenant has the ability to care and the ability to afford um, the property and we have to do that as best as we can. So that's where we will ask for that ID to support the application process. Uh, from a lesser agent's point of view also, once we've uh, collected that information, we need to be very conscious that we can't just go and simply start making phone calls or, or sending out requests to other agents to confirm that information. Um, there's a big piece of legislation we need to consider here and that's the Privacy Act. 
um, part of the application process is that we should always be getting the consent from those applicants on not only the ability to collect that information, but to use it to get those references. Um, without that consent, technically, we can't go and get those references. Um, and lessors and agents will touch on that um, if, uh, if you request that information. Uh, something else as part of the application process that we will um, touch on is making sure that you're getting an emergency point of contact or a next of kin um, or something along those lines because that's always an important part. Maybe not necessarily at the start of the tenancy but it could be helpful through the tenancy as well. When we're looking at the application process in its entirety, one of the, one of the most important things we have to be mindful of as lessors and agents is considering the Anti-Discrimination Act. Um, we always need to be very conscious that we can't decline um, or reject an application based on something that could be considered discriminatory under this law. Um, and we'll have a chat about that a little bit later on, but there's certainly uh, some very strict guidelines there that we need to consider as part of that process. So Nick, quite often we are asked, can we say no to a smoker or someone with a pet? Look, overall, a property owner has the ability to say no to someone who smokes or has pets. Um, and the reason for that is it's not listed specifically in the discrimination laws as an attribute that we need to consider. Um, if we are to go down that track, though, um, as an agent, I would always educate my lessors um, in the importance of, uh, I suppose, outlining any conditions or any um, obligations that a smoker or someone with pets may have as part of that tenancy process. Um, and we can include that in as a special term in the tenancy agreement. As a real estate agent, um, we don't have the ability to draft any special terms. Um, we're not qualified to do so under what they call the Legal Profession Act. Um, so it's always recommended that you seek some independent advice on some appropriate wording. Um, and the reason that I touch on that is you might have something along the lines of the tenant might be responsible for having flea fumigation done at the end of the tenancy if they've had a pet at any stage. Um, or that smoking is only permitted outside the property um, and not inside. So they're things to consider, um, but certainly from an agent's point of view. Um, and even that as a lessor, I'd recommend getting some independent advice on how they're appropriately worded. Before a tenant is committed into a tenancy, the tenant must be given a copy of the tenancy agreement. By being committed, that means paying any money, so that's whether it's a holding deposit, rent or bond money, or signing an agreement or any other document that commits the tenant into that tenancy. The tenancy agreement for that particular property needs to be fully completed, minus the tenant's name and a start date. Should have any special terms um, should be completed on the agreement and also to how you're wanting the tenant to pay rent. You cannot charge an application fee. There are restrictions on amounts that can be taken from a prospective tenant. The only money that you can take from a prospective tenant is a holding deposit, key deposit, rental bond or rent. Owners or their managing agents cannot ask a prospective tenant to pay any other fees. There are rules around holding deposits and also the maximum amount of rental bond and rent in advance amounts that can be charged. So please refer to the RTA's website for more information. What happens if the application is not successful or you have multiple applications? Um, look, the market changes from time to time, so there's no right or wrong answer um, because it could vary depending on the property and the marketplace. Um, we do need to be very conscious that uh, there is situations where we'll have multiple applications and you can't put everyone in the property for obvious reasons. Um, we do need to be really cautious of the language, I believe, in, in how we talk to prospective tenants if their application hasn't been successful. Saying something along the lines of your application means rejected or denied can be quite harsh and, and hard-hitting. Um, using something along the lines of your application hasn't been successful at this point in time. Um, it's a little bit softer, means the same things. Um, you could also consider that those applicants might be suitable for other properties and it was just that they weren't lucky enough to get that particular property. Um, so having a chat with them about other potential properties that might be suitable uh, is important there as well. Um, once an application is at an end and if it hasn't been successful um, as an agent and definitely as a lessor as well, um, we need to be conscious again of the privacy, um, making sure that we secure the information or we destroy it appropriately, that we don't just have that information out there available um, or where someone could pick up. Nick, what would be your top five tips to share regarding today's topic? Um, the five points I'd probably consider most important regarding today's topic would be, first and foremost, making sure the properties are ready, um, that there's no breach of any health and safety laws, um, it's clean and tidy and it's ready to go. Um, even if it's still tenanted, it still needs to be ready to go um, on the date that you've uh, advertised it's going to be available from. 
um, have your property insurances up to date, your building, your contents, um, public liability, and it's also recommended to have landlord's insurance as well. Um, hopefully you never have to use it, but in the event that you may need to make a claim down the track. Um, being prepared at your inspections um, and being able to help educate those potential tenants of what they do from there if they're wanting to apply. Having a copy of their application form, um, letting them know what ID and 100 points, proving address, previous history, those things that we chatted about a little bit earlier, um, because that will vary from agency to agency or even landlord to landlord. Um, so tenants aren't expected to read your mind and know exactly what you're after. Um, making sure you do your reference checks, um, whether it's their past rental history, confirming employment or a source of income, um, and definitely the tenancy database checks and being very thorough with those and making sure that you've got evidence of uh, what the outcomes of those reference checks are. Um, remembering as a landlord it's the, your property and you can choose who you put into the property. In saying that though, we do need to be mindful of the Anti-Discrimination Act. Um, we also need to be conscious of the privacy laws and the tenancy laws that impact on that process as well. So thank you for your assistance today and again a special thanks to our guest Nick Brown from the REIQ. Remember if you need any information regarding Queensland tenancy laws, rights and responsibilities, contact the RTA or go to the RTA's website rta.qld.gov.au.